Pitt Stein enjoyed the talk. Uh, I have a question relating to your uh, penultimate uh, a line there about a local analysis for the anthropic domain. Uh, a few people have talked about the idea of coarse tuning, the idea being that uh, uh, over an infinite domain, any finite region is, uh, is negligible. So maybe we don't need a notion of smallness as long as a life-supporting or life-friendly region is finite. Uh, do you see that as making this sort of argument more robust, or is it more of a reductio ad absurdum, or how would you... Uh, how would you respond to the idea of course tuning? Okay, so I don't think this is what I have in mind here. I mean, the question, when I was saying local, I was meaning that there, we have some descriptions of physics today, and we use this description to understand all physical phenomena in our own universe. And it is, it is important to keep in mind that if I want to explain the whole universe from BBN time, so one second after the Big Bang to two days, the, the only physics I need is going to the what, uh, 100 MeV scale. So I don't, know, I don't need to know anything about high energy physics. I don't care about the, the LHC to explain up to BBN. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking these low energy physics laws and I'm changing the constant. And then I'm saying, ah, oh, there is something which is not working. I don't make carbons or whatever. But I cannot be sure that there, there are like, you know, islands somewhere else with different forms, different <coughs> number of flavor or whatever, different number of interactions that will lead to a viable universe. That there is no way, I mean, for me to know that. I mean, it would be like, you know, exploring all possible structures, which I have no idea about. So the only thing you are doing is that just, you take what you know, you vary the fundamental constant, you just keep the, 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 the mathematical formula of the law to be the same. And this is only what you are doing. So, of course, this is the first thing you want to do. You want to know, I mean, how far, how, how close you have to be from what you actually measure. But I don't think it's enough to, you know, to, to draw conclusion on the whole picture. This is, I mean, I'm not saying more than that. I mean, it's just... Uh... Um, thanks very much, Jean-Philippe. A, a lovely talk. Um, it, it just reminded me, and, and this may be a question for tomorrow, but wasn't there, a few years ago, there was a very nice sort of speculation by a number of physicists that if you simply worked on the hypothesis that the, you know, in terms of a time variation of fundamental constants, if you took the speed of light and allowed it to take a completely different value in the first fractions of an instant, you could reproduce quite, quite a lot of the feature, features of inflation. Do you know, I, I completely forgotten what, what, I've never thought about it since. What, what happened about that? Was it ruled out by observation or do you know? We have cameras and microphones here. <laughs> okay, so I will tell you my vision of the of, of this story because I was involved in partly with uh, with George Ellis on, on, on this thing. So there were these varying speed of light theories, and I, and I think the first idea is that, I mean the first so it's very difficult because actually they, it's kind of proteiform idea. I mean it started with some kind of ideas and it was modified all the way, and I think the first ideas were to my mind wrong in some sense. What they, what was done is that. People were writing the Friedman equations and the equation of conservation of uh, stress energy tensors. So basically, and then they were saying, if you vary C, then, well, you get this C dot in your equation, in your Friedman equation. Or, and, and then you can find a C of T, which allows you to solve all cosmological problems. As I, as I argued before, you are not allowed to do that because if, you're, uh, if a constant is varying, then your field equation will be changed and you have to do that in a consistent way and you are not allowed to, to choose C of T as a solution. It has to be to satisfy some kind of uh, Klein-Gordon equation if it's a scalar field or whatever. And then it was modified and in the end, these things, they become some kind of scalar tensor theory like the one proposed by Bekenstein. So actually, I think they, they evolve and, and now they are part of the whole bunch of models which are studied by people working on, on these kind of ideas where you have different uh, couplings to different fields. And I think this is, a, I would say, we know what is a minimal setting. This is, as I said, this is general relativity plus the standard model of particle physics. My, what I would like to know is from what I can observe, can I constrain the, the kind of new degrees of freedom you need in your theory and how they are coupled to the standard matter fields? And today, uh, well, there is just this one claim that the fine social constant is varying. I will discuss that tomorrow. But that's it. And if we don't measure any time variation or space variation of any constant, then we cannot say anything because it will still be compatible with the standard framework. So that's... Exactly. That's, that's so I think what we have to do is that you have to leave... The, I mean, the, there is always an invariant velocity, okay, in these theories. So even if you say C of T you know, is falling with time. Um, you know, C of t is a constant over t squared. You know, there's another constant in there. There is always a constant. 
um, because you know if you say c is a function of some phi scalar field, then you know when you solve box phi is zero or something else, uh, there are always two constants of integration. So there is no way of removing uh, a <coughs> constant with units of a velocity by making c of t. So what we were trying to do was to make light speed fall with time. Gravity still had a, a universal velocity associated with it for gravitational waves, and that sat in the metric. Uh, but in the Friedman equation, lambda c squared could fall off you know, faster than the matter density, and k c squared over a squared could fall off faster than matter density. So when a became very large, you not only approached flatness, but you also approached lambda is zero. So, so that was the idea, but you somehow have to make this rigorous. Yes, and yeah. yeah, so I thought, I mean, George and your, your paper, I think, uh, sort of overstated the criticism by thinking that, by claiming that, you know, we were abandoning all absolute velocity, but we were leaving well, yes, and no, and so C that's gravitation that's... as being a fundamental yeah. constant. But, but in the first paper, this was, I mean, not yours, but I mean, with Albach, this was the way it was written. And then we had some email exchange, and I, I was asked, how do you vary the Lagrangian? And I got like half a page to explain to me how you vary a Lagrangian, which I think you should not. I mean, as I said before, you just say which are the field, which are the Lagrange multiplier, and which are the constant. And then, I mean, this is like reproductibility of deriving equations, and you don't need like, you know. And I think there was something weird in the way, you know, like special way of using a variational principle and so on. So that's. Uh, but I think all these things have clarified because you know when you start working on these ideas, I think there were people knowing about that. I mean, if you if you if you were talking to to Dicky or even today to people like Thibaut Damour, they knew about all these things. But I think it's this kind of question open to a wider community, and people rediscovered the standard results. And of course, some people did like all mistakes that were known. So it's a kind of rediscovery. And I think now everything is we, everyone agrees on on these things, and and these models where you can implement. I mean, because I said. Um, you can always say that each time I have a function which is a speed of light, I put a function of a scalar field. You are allowed to do that in your Lagrangian, and then you vary everything. Whether you call that varying speed of light, or that, it's just a question of taste. Like if I if I take a scalar tensor theory, some people will tell you, ah, oh, it's varying gravitational constant. Some other will tell you it's varying masses. Well, this is the same. If all the masses are varying the same way, you just have like a conformal transformation. It's the same theory. What is important is g m square over h bar c. So when I say it's a varying mass, it's just because in my mind, I know that I'm working in units in which the value of g, h bar, and c are constant. And that's just it. And sometimes, you know, people are, I mean, if you're not working in the field, there are some confusion. But I think it's mostly now everyone is working with the same uh, understanding of, of these things. This thing about, you know, the six numbers that yes. Martin reached, which, you know, as you rightly said, is a, a sort of gross oversimplification. I mean, if you just assume general relativity was true, and that the universe contained sort of baryons, radiation, some type of dark matter, and a lambda term, then you need 17 functions to specify the initial data mm -hmm. of three variables. If you assume the universe is exactly homogeneous, or almost so, you need 17 okay. constants. So that's just for the cosmology. Just for the, co so it doesn't take into account like, so I have in my list, I have 19 uh, dimensions. Yeah, so it's ignoring that. Which are entering the yeah. Lagrangians. And then so plus so the cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant, you can argue whether it's yeah. cosmological yeah. or fundamental yeah. physics uh, side. And, and then you, you need 17 more than that. Yeah. yeah. That's probably. So the question is whether we are. Why, why is this homogeneous amount? Well, you, in general relativity, in vacuum, you need four pieces of initial data. So four functions specified on T as constant slice. Each fluid you, you add, you need three um, velocities and either the pressure or the density. In the case of land, you just need one. So, yes, so then they just become constants. Yeah. So vacuum plus one perfect fluid is four plus four. Vacuum plus three fluids is four plus 12, uh, plus lambda, another one. I, I have a comment and a question. So the comment is, I would hope that at some level the philosophical talks that we've had over the last two days um, do connect with the way that anthropics is being used or perhaps is rather uh, implicit anyway in what physicists are doing. So um, I think what we saw with, with Nick um, and Chris's talk is a great deal of attention to um, what is the reference class, do we need such an assumption at all or is this a, a form of Bayesian reasoning? Um, so. 
I would, I would hope that that question does have some relevance to the ways in which cosmologists are, are using anthropic reasoning. Um, I suppose too bad for philosophers if it doesn't, um, or, or perhaps too bad for physicists if it does and they don't realize it. But anyway, okay, so here's my question. Um, the local analysis, can you, the, your question at the bottom, can we be sure that there are no other islands? Um, are you there referring to the possibility of, of beings similar to ourselves but perhaps significantly different, um, so perhaps that would correspond to a larger reference class, or uh, do you mean beings like ourselves but with uh, particular combinations of fundamental constants that allow biological processes to roughly go on as they do in our, in our island? No, I was saying that if you, like when in this argument you use the fact that the measure value of the, the Hubble parameters tell you basically when you are making your observation in a given cosmological models. If I'm able now to construct an experiment to push the measurement of the phase structure constant to one more decimal, and imagine there are someone in another galaxy which are exactly like us, like, like clones of us. The same, we are in a Friedman, so we know what is this, the time slicing. So they have the same value of the Hubble parameters. They do this, the same thing, and they, they, they just, at the 13th or 14th decimal, they, they have something different from us. How do you implement that? I would say that my feeling, my, my feeling is that it's irre irre irrelevant information. The question is when do you decide that some information is relevant or not? And this is what I was trying, so I've not, you know, I've just, when I was preparing this talk, I was trying to put all these things together because I, I thought it would be connected to this question. Uh, I know that if I change some, some parameters by 10 to the minus five, I will change drastically the, the dynamics of, let's say, population three stars. I mean, having the whole problem for, for carbon. That is important at 10 to the minus five. If I change it at 10 to the minus seven, it will not change anything because I have a distribution of different mass of stars and metallicities and so on. And basically, the picture, I mean, the, the average things that for the whole universe won't be changed. So the question is, what, at which level do I need to know these numbers to know that actually I can be, I consider myself, you know, being in the same class as you? I have no answer about that. I mean, just... But I, I had the feeling when I, I read this literature on, 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 on typical observers that People do insist on what is a, fun, I mean, a, a typical observer and an observer. how do you define the observers and how he knows that he's a, in a given class. And it's not clear to me. So I just wanted to, to raise that, maybe to show my ignorance about these things. But I, I have the feeling this is something which really needs to be thought about is when do you say that you are in a class? And what is there? I, I have the feeling that there is some kind of cross graining and you can take further information and after a given uh, precision, it does, you don't care. The question is when. So, I mean, if, if I've understood you right, when you're asking are there other islands, this really is a question about the reference class and how it's yeah. defined. Right, good, good, thank you. Uh, we will return to these themes tomorrow, especially in the closing discussion when you will have your chance to ask questions in depth and skewer the speakers with the incisiveness of your analysis. <laughs> Meanwhile, on your way out, do connect a glimpse of your uh, future. March the 17th to the 19th in a town in a low-lying fen somewhat northeast of here, whose name I forget, uh, on the constants of nature. Thank you very much, Professor Ouzan, for a wonderful talk. Thank you.